Hey there, sailors. It's First Mate Pruitt, and it's your Captain Jim Dave Davis. Um, you, were you not going to... I mean, Captain wears whatever they want, you know. Can, can you at least wear the hat? Yeah. Yeah, I can wear the hat. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> and today we're going to... Today we're going to talk about the ghosts of Salt Marsh. And all those islands plagued by salty semen here on WebD. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> I'll do a different one. All right, Jim. Let's do another little haunting review, shall we? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a good segue to start. Um, Ghosts of Salt Marsh. Ghosts of Salt Marsh. Which uh, we got our copy at uh, D&D Live. It was, sure, it was yeah. fun. It was part of a little swag bag. Now, I have not looked through it as much because A, I'm not running it, uh, and I try not to read things because I might actually play in it. Oh, sure, sure. Especially yeah. if you have it. Uh, except for the, the part at the end. Yeah, you know, yeah. With all the, but we'll get to that. <laughs> um, all the appendices and whatnot. Oh, but yeah. where do you think this ranks with the versus the other books that have come out thus far? I sort of have two minds about it. On the one hand, I like that it's not an adventure path style module, yeah. right? And and I think, you know, maybe the first few in, in uh, the series, you know, uh, Rise of Tiamat, Princess of the Apocalypse, uh, even Out of the Abyss, that those three, sort of like the original uh, three for, uh, for D&D 5th edition had a very set, like, this is the, you're saving the world, you're, or, you know, or at least stopping some cosmic level threat or extra planar threat. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's very much like, e even if they had travel or other stuff, it's like the, someone's going to tell you where to go and what to do. And, yeah, I mean, it, you're not going to say it was on rails, but it was pretty much on rails. Yeah, it's more on, it's certainly more so than uh, some of the other adventures. So like Storm King's Thunder has a lot of exploration and just wandering around. But both Storm King's Thunder and uh, Tomb of Annihilation, one of the common complaints that I saw was that there was too much just wandering around. And especially for like Tomb of Annihilation where you're only moving one hex a day and even though there's this jungle full of locations and, and all these interesting things to do, they are separated by miles and miles and miles of dinosaur filled, uh, you know, zombie infested jungle. In terms of that, we haven't really seen anything like Ghosts of Salt Marsh yet. Maybe mm -hmm. uh, Tales from the Awning Portal comes the closest, I think, mm -hmm. in that it's a a series of unconnected adventures that the dungeon master is allowed to kind of use to create their own uh, campaign or their own sort of adventure framework for uh, for their party. But whereas to, uh, Tales from the Awning Portal felt more like, yeah, we're going to take some of the greatest hits of dungeon delves from past editions and just convert them and update them and then provide like a loose framework if you need it. Ghosts of Saltmarsh is like, here is a setting that's in a different world than Forgotten Realms, number one. Uh, it's set, we have actual Greyhawk now. It's a fully fleshed out and realized setting with uh, all kinds of, of NPCs and things to do and localities. It's a, uh, a series of adventures that can fit in that setting as well as sort of suggestions for how they might fit in other settings, how they might link them together, how you would integrate Tales of the Yawning Portal <laughs> with it, right? Where you would put those uh, dungeons uh, in, in the setting. And then easily a good chunk of the book is just an expansion of the naval exploration and underwater environment rules found in the DMG and Xanathar's Guide. And if you've been following Unearthed Arcana, the, you'll know that there's been a slow evolution of these rules through yeah. various iterations. Uh, the latest one being um, of ships and sea, which is what they call, you know, the uh, one of the appendices. I've spent most of my time in that in this section as well, modifying it and, and sort of making it do what I want it to do, testing it out, uh, and seeing, you know, at the very least, like from a DM's prep side, if I was to use these rules to prepare an adventure, and I have. Uh, you know, what would it look like? How would they play out at the table? And then, of course, in the appendices, there's also a bunch of, like, monsters and magic items, things like that. So what we have is a, a book that's a lot more integrated and a lot more about, like, taking the, the campaign that you're going to run and making it very much about this, like, locality in the kingdom of Kaoland in, in Greyhawk. And you're not dealing with world-spanning threats. 
There's not really mm -hmm. extra planar stuff going on, although there's some pretty significant threats in the module, right? Like there's some pretty nasty enemies in there. Providing you with the tools you need to turn all of this into a big campaign, but not necessarily prescribing a certain way you should do that, a certain way for the players to approach it. it it's, it's a true sort of like, here's a sandbox. You know, there's a kind of a meta plot going on. There's sort of an overall arc, but you don't have to use it, you can use it. That's in contrast to say something like Tomb of Annihilation or Curse of Strahd, where to get to the mini sandbox they include, you have to strip out a bunch of stuff yeah. and sort of like reshape it into something different. Whereas Ghost of Saltmarsh just presents you with the pieces and all kinds of connections. Like the, the number of ways you can generate adventures mm -hmm. with this book is kind of insane, <laughs> like compared to other D&D 5e stuff. It does seem more like... Um... It would be more like Lego versus like other adventures being a puzzle that you put together Certain, to come yeah. with a final picture. Whereas this yeah, is yeah. like you could just take this piece and this piece and don't use this or use this. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, and I know we said similar things about Ravnica and that, that Ravnica has a you know really great uh, potential to generate adventures. The the difference between say Ghost of Saltmarsh and Ravnica is that Ravnica only has um, Krenko's Way, which is a very short introductory adventure before it basically like turns you loose with a book full of tools to make your own Ravnica campaign. And Ghost of Saltmarsh does a lot of that work for you by updating these seven adventures, which are all set in and around either the, the town of Saltmarsh or are, you know, have been adapted to fit within it, uh, to fit within that setting. And like, in that sense, it's a bit less of a toolkit than Ravnica is. Mm -hmm. And there's more things I would have liked to have seen from it as a toolkit that we don't get. Um, but it's also more of a structured, you can use this out of the box adventure than Ravnica was, which really requires a lot of work on the DM's part to put something together and, and make it work. So, gosh, that's a long winded way of saying that. It ranks near the top. <laughs> Tyranny of Dragons is worth a playthrough because of the classicness of the dragons, the classic, you know, sort of fighting the cult. It, is it on rails? Maybe more so than others, but it, you know, especially having spoken with uh, some of the designers on it now uh, and getting their inside perspective on how they went about it, like I, the work that you would have to, you know, that you have to put into it is worth it. And I think it's a pretty fun, you know, module for when uh, when we ran it. And Out of the Abyss is probably like if you think about the nature of D and D. And just like the game that is D and D, which is about a group of misfits and you know who are, you know just social outcasts gaining power and wealth and influence for themselves in this world, like out of the abyss, kind of the most classic of them, right? You're mm -hmm. trapped in the underdark. You've got to become powerful enough to escape, and then you go down and exact your revenge. <laughs> yeah, they did mess with the wrong people that time. <laughs> right, and that's even if you're like playing good surface dwellers, not necessarily uh, evil uh, underdark denizens. <laughs> Yeah, potato, uh, potato. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've read through most of the others and either played through um, some or all of Tomb Annihilation and Curse of Strahd. I like them. I think Curse of Strahd's probably the, the tightest and most focused. If you're not interested in any of those, if you're a DM that likes to have players that just sort of wander around and get into trouble and do their own thing and discover what they want to do about the game, all of those adventures require more work than Ghost of Saltmarsh. Ghost of Saltmarsh assumes that the wandering vagrant adventurer who kind of like troubleshoots around town and, and, and doesn't necessarily have a place in it uh, is sort of the default there. Yeah. And, and I like that. That's classic D&D. &D. Since it is in a different, uh, technically in a different D&D &D setting, let's yeah. just start with the setting, with yeah. the, you know, uh, the setting that this is in. It is Greyhawk. And if you uh, follow us on, uh, you know, Patreon or, or just uh, in, in other social media platforms, I, I, I'm, I like Greyhawk. I like it uh, more so than the other um, quote-unquote generic uh, traditional fantasy worlds that uh, are in D&D's catalog. You know, the others would include things like, obviously, Faerun, but also the worlds of Birthright and Mistara, which makes an appearance uh, in this one. Um, they're, you know, they all fall within this kind of traditional fantasy spectrum. I like Greyhawk because when I read about Greyhawk, it feels more like a real place than other D&D worlds. And mm -hmm. I think part of it is, is also that when I read Greyhawk, you're reading 
like the history of the first campaigns of D and D that were ever right. run. And you're when you look at say a lot of the NPCs in Greyhawk, you're not talking about just fictional elements that were made up to sell this module. You're talking about this was a person's character that they played and leveled up with and had experiences with. They got incorporated into this world's mythology mm -hmm. that then gets presented as the archetypal D and D world. And so in that sense, like I know Greyhawk gets a lot of flack for being vanilla and boring and whatever, but it's like there's whole nations ruled by demon princes and the world suffered several terrible magical cataclysms which have scattered the inhabitants of those empires all across the continent. The, it, it's shaped by wars and oh, yeah. politics and if you like, if you like, say, Game of Thrones. You know, like kind of a nittier, grittier fantasy, then Greyhawk fits it a lot better than Forgotten Realms. And the fact that they went ahead and, and were able to sort of like say, all right, we've, <laughs> we've had plenty of time in the Forgotten Realms. I, there's places on Faerun that I wish they'd visit more of. Uh, the Shining South, Lands of Intrigue, those would be really cool places. But um, to visit Greyhawk to me and to make it open for people to like make things on the DMs Guild to... Yeah. To play in it, that's that's really special. And Jim, you know, it'd be nice to learn about other places in Faerun, but we keep forgetting about these other realms. I mean, we've given they have, to, they have to remind oh, us, geez. and that's I mean, that's the whole deal, right? Yeah, that's true. You're right. You're right. My what if what if there was like a <laughs> magical, like a meta magical meta plague that uh -huh. was put on the Forgotten Realms, and that's why they stay in the Forgotten Realms because we all we have to keep reminding keep ourselves like ourselves Memento. About them. Yeah, if we could just remember them, we could move on. <laughs> we could just have other books. So, so forgotten. Specifically, Saltmarsh takes place in and around the town of Saltmarsh, which is in the Kingdom of Kaoland on its southern coast. Uh, and southern coast of the Kingdom of Kaoland. Yes, right. and I'm not like that's about as much as I know about the place. It's a kingdom known as Kaoland. Uh, but the the Ghost of Saltmarsh gives you just a brief overview. They're a military powerful country. They they've been at war with uh, sort of other naval powers in their vicinity uh, at various points. There's a lot of like intrigue between Kaoland and the Scarlet Brotherhood, which if I'm remembering my Greyhawk lore, is sort of like represents remnants of one of those pre-cataclysmic uh, magical civilizations. And then there's the pirate lords, I think, just sort of a generic, um, uh, you know, confederacy of pirate uh, states and the like. So you've got this quiet backwater. It's got sort of, uh, you know, the, the feel of it is like a mid-Atlantic kind of coastal place. It's slow. Life uh, here is, uh, you know, flows at its own pace. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of like creeping dread, a lot of just, you know, what's going on over there? You know, a lot of outsiders that don't want you poking around and, you know, old mm -hmm. uh, alliances with fish people and like a... I was going to say, it's very, it sounds very Lovecraftian. It, it, certainly. I mean, it's got a lot of those elements to yeah. it, right? It's got a lot of these sort of Lovecraftian Innsmouth elements with, with it being a, a quiet coastal backwater. Uh, you know, sleepy little, uh, uh, you know, fishing villages and the like. But where it really shines is that it provides just enough detail on the town of Saltmarsh, its immediate environs, and, and like finding adventure within those places. So you get a brief overview of the factions. They're traditionalists, loyalists, and then the Scarlet Brotherhood, who are uh, the secret sort of, they kind of take the place of the Zentarum in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, each one of those factions has NPCs associated with it. It's got sample events so that if you want to have a, an adventure or a quest or something that features a faction as the centerpiece, you've got like a D8 table of inspiration for that. Um, as it outlines the various uh, parts in town, they, they provide all kinds of tables for like, what's the mood on the docks today? Is it, was it a good catch? Was it a bad catch? How does that influence the mood of the town? You know, what, what's going on? Are, you know, are there any rumors down by the docks of adventure that we might want to seek out? Or if we go down to one of several taverns in town, what might we learn there? And so like there's at least uh, four or five sort of mini tables that you roll on when the party goes around salt marsh and it could be like all right there's a mining company in town what bounties or jobs might they have for us here so you know today we're going to go guard a mine shaft against dwergar incursions from the underdark and you know next week we go to the who will watch uh, the who watch tower and, and look for bounties there and we're going and collecting uh, you know giant alligator uh, heads, you know, you know to, to deal with them. There's a lot there that if the players are just like, I want to try this, mm -hmm. I want to do this, 
the DM has a lot of tools to just quickly read, like, oh, okay, I got something for that. Yeah. You know, and it's everything. There's a carpenter who wants you to acquire exotic woods, you know, pieces of wood that he can work into different uh, quasi magical items while you're out there. So, yeah. probably, so probably like off. containers to hold dice and uh, oh, yeah. little towers. Certainly. Yeah, little to towers, them. dice, little, little trays. <laughs> it's, it's a great just, gaming community in Salt Lake. Perfect Marsh. gaming community. Uh, there's a lot of sailors, right? What mm -hmm. else are they going to do? It, it is really trying to specify and contextualize the things that are in the player's handbook and make it so that when you're creating characters, you are from this part of the world. There's a whole section on how the downtime activities that are presented in the DMG and the Player's Handbook translate into Salt Marsh. Not just, you're not just rolling on a, a, a carousing table, you're going down to the Wicker Goat. And you're these, are the, these are the people who are typically there. And so when you roll on those tables, say in Xanathar's, for what happens, you can then cross-reference them with Ghost of Salt Marsh to get more specific answers. And because you're dealing with like the NPCs that are already there, it's just a way to just keep generating events, complications, new connections mm -hmm. and everything. And that's just in the first chapter. Uh, it finishes out with a, uh, a list of how to incorporate the backgrounds into Salt Marsh, all of them, including the four new ones, uh, Fisher, Marine, Shipwright, and Smuggler. Mm -hmm. uh, a quick note on those, as far as I can tell, Shipwright is one of the few ways to like repair your ship in combat. We get to talking about like of ships and sea. I, I, it would be hard to imagine how you could play through some of these adventures without someone in the party being a shipwright and being able to like really repair and, and whatever. The ability to repair one ship, uh, yeah. you got to have Scotty running around while you everything's going, Scotty. you know, tits up. And... Uh, it also includes sort of an overview of what's in and around in the wilderness surrounding Salt Marsh, whether settlements are nearby, and as well as providing quick uh, random tables for the various um, adventure zones, I guess you would call mm -hmm. them, you know, Hool Marsh, uh, the Drowned Forest, or the Dreadwood. Each Ooh. of them has their own like different theme, you know. Ooh, that's fun. I like that. Like, I, I think of all of them, I like the Dreadwood because it's sort of like counterharmonious with the Shadow Plane. You, you can mix in some of those effects on people's emotions or or emotional state that the Shadow Plane uh, can uh, can give you. It's also apparently the location of several of the uh, uh, Tales of the Yawning Portal dungeons. So like. That it's that first uh, the first chapter there really if you if you just read it and internalize it would let you really take the setting and make it your own, um, and then it sets you up for these adventures that are uh, the bulk of the book. You have the setting, you go around, you can find adventure. Yeah. But what are those adventures? What can some ne'er do wells or heroes or whatever in between? <laughs> uh, they're coming from the what was it the the wicker goat. The Wicker Goat. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I love that name. I would open a bar next to it called The Goats of Salt Marsh. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, there you go. Or that would be my adventuring party. There you go. <laughs> the Goats of Salt Marsh. <laughs> but yeah, what could the Goats of Salt Marsh get up to? After? Uh, so there are uh, seven adventures included uh, with Ghosts of Salt Marsh, and it's a bit like uh, Tales of the Yawning Portal. They're updating these uh, other ones. So in non-chronological order, this is the order they're presented in the book, but not necessarily the order they were published uh, you know, over the last 30 years. The Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh, which is um, kind of a historic module, came out in 1981 yeah. and was one of the, like, it's the first appearance of having to sneak onto a pirate ship. It's the first sort of like, this is a wilderness sea, you know, sea adventure, but there's not necessarily a lot of like dungeons around. You, you get to, you know, like I said, you get to sneak on board a pirate ship. There's a really cool like mansion of an old alchemist. So there's like a lot of, trick monsters and, and monsters you've never seen before, a lot of custom ones mm -hmm. uh, related to alchemy and it being more of like a, a fun house haunted mansion than mm. a, you know, murder house. Starting to see where you get that inspiration for those Vivamancers. Oh, the Vivamancers were, they were lots of inspirations for them. It's really fun. I like it because it's this haunted house adventure coupled with the sneaking aboard a pirate ship. And then it kicks off these two other adventures, uh, or at least two others, uh, Danger at Dunwater and then uh, The Final Enemy, which is later on in the uh, order of adventures. But these three, the sort of Salt Marsh trilogy, I mean, they're classic adventures because they feature things like the Kolanth and the Lo uh, Lokatha. And you have to, uh, The Final Enemy is about assaulting a fortress. Yeah. And there's like dozens and dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of shark men <laughs> inside of it that you've got to like 
attack and sabotage and and it's a big like sea battle against these shark people and mm -hmm. you're having to negotiate between all these different aquatic uh peoples who are who are sort of like treated with suspicion and and you know almost like you know it doesn't matter you're a monster you know no matter what you do and so the players have an opportunity to like bridge the gap there and uh, make an impact on the localities. And I, those three are ones I really want to run, mm -hmm. um, but they all could be run as one shots, all seven of them. Uh, so beyond the initial Salt Marsh trilogy, classic D&D action, um, there is Salvage Operation, which is about a sunken ship. You've got to go like find it, recover the treasure off of it, and then uh, have to deal with like a giant octopus attack. <laughs> like there's a whole set piece with like a, a big sort of pseudo kraken that you have to deal with at like third or fourth level. Um, I think that one's probably one of the ones I've got my eye on is like, I want to run this as a one shot. Like I don't know, you know, like I just want to play this one. It looks really fun. And then the others of, of the ones that I really like is called the sty, uh, sorry, the styles. And it's a city cult investigation adventure. It features elements of Thurisdun, who is a Greyhawk deity of like secrets and, uh, you know, has the desire to like just unmake the multiverse responsible for creating astral dreadnoughts and all other kinds of craziness. And, and so it's got them, it's got a juvenile Kraken in it. So you get to fight like a, a, a depowered version of a Kraken. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, it's, it's the most Innsmouth of all of them because it's just like a old salty little town seaside town that's just got a bunch of messed up fish cultists in it. Once they get in there, it's hard to get them out. <laughs> it's really hard to get them out. The other two adventures are called Isle of the Abbey and uh, Tamarot's Fate. And I just like, they're both like an, a, a lone island is being beset by an undead threat kind of adventures. Mm -hmm. And so they're a little similar, but you could easily uh, modify them. You know, one of them features like drowned uh, enemies that are coming up out of the sea as sort of like, uh, you know, undead uh, mm -hmm. menace. And another is more like harpies and uh, like they're being, uh, you know, harassing these uh, these monks that live on an island. Well, yeah, I mean, the former is very, it's very parts of the Caribbean. Oh, yeah. Like trying to get into the, the oh, yeah, actual, yeah. Uh, the place there. Yes. Or, yeah. or also uh, Lord of the Rings. That's one of my favorite parts when they're oh, crossing yeah. the, the marshes. Yes. Of the battlefield. Yeah. And, and you just sort of like see the... All of that that resides <laughs> below. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's... But that, I love that kind of stuff because it plays on our natural fear uh -huh. of the ocean. Because yeah. after a few feet, you can't see that, it, and there's yeah. a lot of it. There's a lot of it down there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. And and you know, you kind of think about it. You're like, yeah, what is on the bottom of the ocean floor in a D and D world? And I mean, my like, in my answer for most things is, hey, what's over here in a D and D world? It's probably undead. Uh, <laughs> you're sort of like waterlogged mm -hmm. uh, zombies just shuffling along the ocean floor. Yeah, um, either that or the byproducts of magical creation and pollution. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Just down there floating. Just down there floating, yeah. <laughs> so that's the adventures. Like I said, the, the, the trilogy, I think, is probably the, the most iconic. A apart from, you know, you going in and going to this haunted house and sneaking on board a pirate ship, there's infiltrating a lizard folk lair Oof. and sort of trying to determine whether or not they're enemies or allies. And then, of course, the final enemy, which is assaulting this mm -hmm. uh, Sahagwan fortress. So, uh, yeah, fun well, times. Uh, according to with personal experience, it's always better to make the lizard folk your friends. Always better. To make Why the fight folk them your when friends? you can have an army? Uh, <laughs> make them adore you. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Save exactly. them. And go, yeah, yeah. You can go hunt, uh, you know, thousand teeth in the whole marshes and all other kinds of stuff. Even in these adventures, there's more to do than just like dungeon crawl. There's stuff going on. Yeah. And so, like. All of that is connected by the rules that are found in the in, in the first of the appendices. And that's where I've spent the most of my time since well, getting the book. Literally where I've only spent my time. Yeah. Um, just because there's some very there's some very interesting tables there. Sure. There's a lot of information just for basic ship information. Yes. Yeah. And having it like in one spot has been absolutely great, but like seeing different sizes of ships and just examples of the ACs and, oh, sure, yeah. and how fast they move and like just breakdowns of it is just a, a boon for for me, like getting ready for uh, coming back with Starward Bound and everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but even from mo moving on from just the ships, like mm -hmm. uh, the encounters at sea charts. Yeah. They're a lot of fun. It's a good start to a, like a really comprehensive exploration system. 
Mm -hmm. And and I I've run two adventures using just the the stuff found in uh, of ships and sea, primarily the travel section and then the encounters at sea uh, section. And we had some interesting. There were some interesting things that happened. Uh, they got caught up fighting some reptilian seagulls, basically, uh, mm -hmm. in one day, and then then you know other times they're sort of like coming across different. Um, you know, aquatic environments and things like that. But what I found was after running it, like, just as is two times, that I, I wanted more out of this. Like, I loved the start of it, but I was just like, I need, like, more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I took uh, the the travel section and the hazards and the encounters at sea and, like, all of those things, the, the ocean environs the, that you find, and kind of rolled them all into one uh, master table and then filled it out with uh, things that were appropriate for my setting. As is, you have enough to run a, a kind of like a short, say, sea voyage or something like that, especially if you were combining it with stuff from the DMG, the other tables from Xanathar's, maybe looking at, say, Storm King's Thunder for mm -hmm. the chapters that take place in the trackless sea there for some inspiration. But just as, as a system of exploration, I'm really impressed with it because they really give you what you need to run a bunch of ocean going or underwater encounters. And the only thing they really don't do there is provide a super detailed system for ship to ship combat. Yeah. The, um, I mean, there are some rules. There are, you could do it, right? But the co ship combat rules seem way more dedicated to recreating fifth edition style skirmish combat on the ocean. You can tell that they work better uh, if, say, you're fighting giant sea creatures as opposed to, like, trading fire with another ship of the line, mm -hmm. uh, you know, master and commander style. And you know what, maybe that's okay, right? This is D&D, this is about the, you know, the personal actions of the heroes, it's about monster fighting, it's about having these big adventures, and you could probably just abstract out like a ship to ship combat because otherwise you might you know your players might feel like well you know the person controlling the guns gets to have <laughs> way more fun than the person who controls when we you know get a boost from our sales the system there is not meant to sort of like create an integrated crew of the party and have them participate in a ship combat it's there for if some of them want to take over certain components of the ship while the rest of the party um, you know, fights the monsters mm -hmm. or fights off the boarding party, then that's what they can do. And it, for that sense, it, it works rather well. I try to do a rudimentary version of that with Starward Bound where, um, like, the pilot could affect people's attack roles or defense roles yeah. based on their role. Yeah, and getting yeah. the ship, get, moving the ship into a more advantageous position for those firing. Sure. Or trying to hide and, you know, giving them bonuses to AC because they were able to pull the ship up and, you know, right, right, give right. them more cover or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, more robust rules for that would be a lot more fun. Yeah, um, I, I know there's a bunch of them on the DMs Guild, and I, I haven't really had a chance to go into a lot of, uh, you know, in-depth of them, and, and I, I'm sure there's even more that are just, like, free online you could find, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you just looked. But I, I would definitely, like... Look them over. If, if you want more, especially like ship-to-ship -ship combat, you're going to have to go somewhere else for that. But what you do get are a ton of ocean environment suggestions, the effects of current, the effects of, say, moving amongst dense coral, uh, what's at the bottom of a blue hole, what's living in this shipwreck. Oh, no, there's a magic storm. What do we do? It just gives you a lot. And if you start combining them, right, you rolled up a couple of encounters on the Encounters at Sea chart, now combine them with some environs that you can, you know, sort of see, like, all right, well, if this is in shallow coral, then maybe it's a bunch of, like, sea creatures attacking the ship using the you know, the, the hiding places that they have in the coral to make hit and run attacks. And if you want them to leave, you're gonna have to like go down there and fight them on their terms. But that's a twisted, jagging, jagged maze of stinging tendrils and polyps and things like that, that they are, that the, you know, merfolk or whatever are mm -hmm. used to and, and you're not. So it highlights that contrast between what's <laughs> above the waves and what's beyond uh, and what's beneath them. I love that section because you can say, you can go say, like, all right, well, we're in a whirlpool, whirlpool, and we're being sucked down into a planar vortex. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, at the last minute we, we, we managed to, to, you know, pull ourselves out of the vortex and now there's, you know, something else wrong. We got to go into a skill challenge of a hazard. Yeah. So just like you can create a lot of different uh, encounters with it and it's just very robust. And, and for that, I, I really like it. Uh, it. Lots of options, lots of 
uh, randomness to it, so you get mm -hmm. a lot of use out of it. Uh, yeah, and there's uh, quite a quite a few uh, new creatures. Oh yeah, um, yeah. New in, uh, NPCs to mm -hmm. pull from. Yep. Uh, not a lot of magic items. No, no, not too many magic. There's like items. six. Yeah, and some of them are repeats yeah. from others, or, or just they're magic items that allow you access to the environment, kind of. Yeah, like the, what is it, the deep, the pressure pill? Pressure pill, or whatever it yeah, is. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was hoping to see maybe more magic items, but you know, I probably would just forget to hand them out anyway. You could always homebrew <laughs> your own. Yes, you could always homebrew your Check own. Check out our video. Uh, so yeah, there's lots of new monsters, and yeah. the new monsters I really like because they, you've now, between like just all of the various monsters, uh, you know, for an aquatic environment, You've got what you need. Um, there's a ton of stuff. You've got plenty of lizard folk, plenty of Sogwin. Um, you know, you can take the two colons that they have and mix them with other goblinoids by just slapping on a swim speed, mostly, uh, mm -hmm. and the amphibious trait. As someone who loves underwater adventures, loves, like, you know, the life aquatic, mm -hmm. um, seeing them all here is really cool. And there's really only, like, a few aquatic monsters that I'm like, yeah, we, why don't we have this yet? Yeah. And, you know, it's easy enough to make a dire jellyfish. Yeah, but when you uh, see a swarm of man of war coming. Right, yeah, yeah. Leave. Just, it's time just, to leave. Just leave. <laughs> One of the things I really like about these is they give you sort of maps for underwater locations, coral reef, shipwreck, uh -huh. uh, you know, underwater ruins. They give you an idea of what might be there, and then they give you some sample, like, mini encounters to include in it. And I, I really like that. It would have been great to see some, like, full-color battles, uh, you know, like, battle map-style underwater maps that we could, like, you know, take out or, or photocopy or, or, you know, download or something. But, you know, that's, like, a minor nitpick yeah. <laughs> compared to everything else that we get. And to me, it's like, for the average campaign that might see one or two ocean-going voyages, they might have, like, a brief foray into an underwater dungeon or something like that. Like, this is enough. You're not going to exhaust these possibilities. If you're running a full-on, like, pirate campaign or, or, like, me right now running, like, a proper underwater aquatic adventures type campaign, then you're going to want to add on more. But this is, like, a solid base. And you could start with just this. And, and use it for a while as you slowly add on other things uh, for, a, for a while before you'd exhaust the possibilities here. Whatever they've been doing the last few books has been working for me. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not really, wasn't really uh, into the, the Waterdeep books, uh, mostly because I've got my own Magic City going on. You know, didn't, didn't need uh, Waterdeep stuff, but Ravnica, Ghost of Saltmarsh, uh, what we've seen of uh, uh, Descent into Avernus, I, I'm really liking the, the direction that they're taking these books because they're giving us tools. They're giving mm -hmm. us... And new locations. New locations. They're giving us the what you need to make your own adventures and not just, like, play through a storyline. Yeah. And for that, like, yeah, bring it on. Love it. Oh, yeah, most definitely. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. WebDM exists thanks to our patrons on Patreon, the WebDM Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes now, including our interview with Wolfgang Bauer, the creator of Cobalt Press. WebDM is a proud partner of D&D Beyond, our favorite supplement for our D&D games. We've got a link to them in the description. Go and check them out. If you like our advice, for your games, watch us play. We've got games every week on Twitch and our archive channel on YouTube, WebDM Plays. Thanks for watching. Question. Do you want me to cut salty semen out completely? Is it too much to swallow? <laughs> I'm just uh, giving no, I'm just I don't. I'm I, just uh, hey, I'm just no. giving you stinger material now.